Let me just say once again, we're delighted to have Monte Clara Costa with us, uh, a citizen, uh, member of the Citizen Participation Committee at the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción, the national anti-corruption system in Mexico. And as I understand it, Marie Claire will be assuming the presidency of the, the anti-corruption system later this week. It's a rotating presidency for one year of service or servitude, however you want to talk about it. But uh, we are delighted to have her and congratulate her on her, her uh, role there. Um, we invited Marie Claire to speak this morning uh, out of recognition for the saliency of corruption and anti-corruption efforts in Mexico and the political debate there. The political landscape in Mexico has been rocked by front page stories about corruption at every level of government. I think I mentioned in my opening remarks that as many as 14 current and former governors are under investigation, but it, it's not limited to governors, municipal level, federal level, even at the president's presidential level. Um, the lack of strong, strong governance is probably among Mexico's biggest challenges today and is becoming a leading issue in the presidential campaign. Our keynote to address, uh, address today is apropos to this challenge and is entitled Fighting Corruption and the Unrule of Law in Mexico. We'll dig into this topic further in the next panel after coffee break. Uh, but we wanted to look, uh, to look much more closely at this issue and invited Marta Claire to speak on it. Um, corruption is no longer uh, viewed solely as a moral issue, the failing of an individual, but has rather become a question of rule of law that must be addressed from a rule of law perspective, one that makes anti-corruption efforts rule of law, and ultimately the struggle for human rights, the central, uh, the central challenge for strengthening democracy in Mexico. And that's why Marie Claire's voice is so important. I don't want to go into detail uh, on her bio. It's in the back. But let me just highlight a couple of things that are relevant to this issue today. She is one of the founders and architects of Mexico's a non-governmental human rights uh, network and movement. Um, she was a leader in the, originally in the Mexican Academy for Human Rights and then founder of one of Mexico's most important governmental organizations, the Commission for the Promotion and Defense of Human Rights in Mexico. But she was not only in the non-governmental sector. She, she became uh, President Fox's uh, Undersecretary for Human Rights and Democracy and the ambassador, Mexico's Ambassador for Human Rights during the 2000s. She also worked uh, at the OAS, the Organization of American States, as the uh, Director of the Office on Promotion of Good Governance where human rights was understood in, in a broader context uh, than simply the legal questions. And then she was also in charge of uh, uh, Freedom House's program for a, creating a human rights protection mechanism in Mexico. So let me stop there and invite Marie Claire to come forward. Uh, I'll, I'll ask her a couple questions at the end and you all can chime in as well. Um, but we are delighted to bring you uh, here to Washington and have you uh, give our keynote address today on a pressing and important issue. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> good morning to you all and thank you very much, Eric, for this presentation and for the invitation to be here. This is really an honor uh, to be able to share some thoughts with you about this great, terrible issue, uh, which is corruption in Mexico. Um, so um, I wrote a few pages that I'm not going to read. I'm going to try to give you the salient points um, of what I have to say. But if you want to um, grab a piece of paper and read it later, uh, I think there's still some out there. We'll, well post it online as well. Okay, good. Well, as Eric said, um, corruption and impunity have become central issues in the current public debate in Mexico. And as he said again, um, this is the result of a, of a recent chain of events and public scandals that go back at least uh, to the abduction and disappearance of a 
students in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero, uh, well, in Iwala, it's called the Ayotzinapa case. But then it was followed, um, this, which was a shocking and terrible event, by a journalistic investigation of alleged payments of favors from a private contractor to President Peña Nieto in the form of a mansion, a very luxurious and beautiful mansion in Mexico City, the infamous uh, Casa Blanca. And then it was followed by the, uh, well, the journalist in charge of this investigation was fired eventually from her uh, position in the broadcasting uh, corporation. But um, so th this sort of sparked um, the, re the, 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 re the revelation of a series of scandals relating to corruption. And then, of course, the gubernatorial races of, um, of, two seven, two, of 216, uh, in which the PRI lost about nine governments, uh, opened up a whole chapter about uh, the embezzlement of public funds by a number of former state government governors. Um, there are 11 former state governors being investigated or, um, or in prison um, for this embezzlement of public funds and very complicated schemes um, to, to finance elections, and et cetera. And then, of course, uh, every practically every, every week in the news, you hear of a faulty freeway uh, that caused casualties. Um, then, of course, we had two earthquakes, and there was very terrible incidents of children being killed as a consequence of unsafe buildings. Um, and even leading up to the use of a state prison in Coahuila as a headquarters for the Zeta cartel that has just recently also been researched and revealed. So these are just samples of what the public has recently learned about how corruption operates in Mexico. And of course, the latest event to rock the political <laughs> system is the judicial investigation in Chihuahua of a network of corrupt federal and state officials charged with funneling public funds that were originally destined for education and other public services um, to electoral campaigns in several states of the republic. And unfortunately, the Treasury, the Secretaria de Hacienda, would appear to be directly implicated in this network. Uh, so corruption is, but of course corruption is not new in Mexico. It's a well-known fact. But it certainly has been dominant in the public debate in the last years. And uh, well, of course, it's endemic and systemic and has long been the case. It's a surprise to no one here. And it's uh, reiterated by every existing measurement on corruption, be it national or inter international. But what is new and encouraging is that it's become a prime issue relevant in the public sphere. And it is central to the warming electoral season with possibly game-changing results in July of this year, as we heard in the previous panel. So um, obviously, and Eric mentioned it, corrup corruption and the de facto impunity enjoyed by its perpetrators cause huge damage and many, many victims. It is, in short, a key and defining component of the current security crisis in which Mexico has been engulfed in a crescendoing fashion during the past decade. It also lies very close um, to the complex situation uh, defined by widespread and grave human rights abuse and the attendant virtual collapse of the criminal justice system. Um, and according to some estimates, it costs Mexico about 10% of its gross domestic product and is a, obviously a major factor in the weak rate of economic growth. Uh, but it also has affected and distorted and thwarted our democratic development and naturally producing a widespread lack of trust and confidence in government institutions at the national, state, and municipal levels. And this lack of trust has been recognized by institutions such as the Instituto Nacional Electoral. 
So none of this is new. So what makes it such a salient issue today? Well, many things. Obviously, there's an accumulation of grievances, frustration, and suffering caused by the causes of corruption, <coughs> by the practices of corruption, and this cannot be underestimated. But there is something uh, new, and that is the mobilization of civil society, including around the issue of corruption, um, a thriving, if nascent, partnership with business leaders to bring the anti-corruption agenda to prominence. And I think this is a quite remarkable um, event. Um, now, w w just a few historical antecedents. Uh, w if you, we remember the Peña Nieto, after winning the election, appropriated a platform of reforms, the Pacto por México. We all know about the Pacto por México. And um, it included um, the Pacto. Um, the need for a creation of a national anti-corruption system. Um, and uh, so there was um, the beginning of a debate uh, on, on, on how to incorporate an anti-corruption system into uh, the laws in Mexico. And in fact, a lot of these initiatives were built on or based on legal reforms and public policy initiatives of the previous administration. Um, but um, so Peña Nieto developed uh, an initiative and um, that it would establish a national anti-corruption commission, uh, Comisión Nacional Anticorrupción, that would be under his wing. And, and it would be partnered by a National Council for Public Ethics, Consejo Nacional para la Ética Pública, which was to include some civil society participation. Neither one of these came into being. Both these initiatives were met with great criticism, especially after the wounding of the presidency resulting from the Ayotzinapa and Casablanca episodes, um, and which were stained by cover-ups. So finally, with input from civil society and business organizations who joined forces, the Senate enacted a constitutional reform. <coughs> On May the 17th to 15, the, president na the present national anti-corruption system came into being and gained its enabling legislation a year later in 2016. So the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción was officially installed in mid-2017, and its goal is to prevent, detect, investigate, and punish acts of corruption, including administrative offenses, as well as to strengthen the institutions charged with this task in the three branches of government. Very ambitious. Um, its institutional design is very complex. Uh, it is a state institution but it operated by government, uh, by the government, but with direct civil society participation in its management, hence the Comité de Participación Ciudadana. And its principal component is a coordinating committee in which several agencies and a just newly created administrative court join efforts in order to develop instruments and policies designed to deter and punish corruption. So as I said before, it's, it's presided by the Citizens Committee, Comité de Participación Ciudadana, which I will preside at the end of this week. And this, I would say, is the most salient and original feature of the system. These members, these uh, citizens, are chosen by a committee of intersectoral leaders from academia, business, and civil society, uh, Viridiana being a member of, of that committee. Uh, with a constitute with a senatorial mandate, um, and the CPC is charged with ensuring that the system functions correctly, with recommendations carried out, and it has the power to introduce issues regarding corruption to the coordinating committee, and to propose the major ten the main tenets of a national anti-corruption policy, and the instruments with which to measure its enforcement. Um, okay, according to the law, the Ley General del Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción, the whole system 
including the local level mirroring replicas of it in the 32 states, were to have been up and running by mid-July in 2017. This did not happen. And I fault, foremost, a political will with very weak resolve. So with meager results to date, this political will must be created and is one of the major tasks facing the Comité de Participación Ciudadana. Um, needless to say, the Sistema is still finding its footing in an incredibly complex and difficult environment. And I note that the complexity of the design, because it includes multiple re agencies and, and it also is replicated at every state, uh, produces, in theory, desirable checks and balances in the implementation of reforms and in the performance of the global system, but is incredibly, incredibly difficult to implement. So having been a member of the Citizens Committee for a year, I can and would like to speak briefly about some of the enormous obstacles that the system faces. Um, it was created under the ex assumption that there existed and exists a real and serious intention to deal with corruption in a decisive and effective manner. And this is an illusion. Corruption and impunity are built into the governing system in Mexico and, to be, and appear to be ingrained in its political class. So we sense in the system a deep ambivalence in the political will. For instance, appointments and nominations of key actors here, such as the 18 magistrates of the newly created administrative court, were done in a business as usual manner, in which political quotas and favors were hardly absent in um, were, excuse me, yeah, were, were hardly absent in an opening gambit to institute real reform. So one of the first activities of the Citizens Commission was to request the Senate to hold off their ratification until the President's office could clarify the criteria that had been used in nominating them. The result was a <laughs> rebuff by the Senate committee charged with the task and followed a few weeks later by a media attack on the system as a whole. Um, another, for instance, formidable uh, obstacle is the integration of these local uh, sistemas locales anticorrupción. Um, up to date, only about half of these 32 state level anti-corruption platforms have been placed. And their implementation has been lamentably subjected to manipulation by state governments and other powers that be, state congresses, et cetera. In, so this led us, again, the Citizens Committee of the system at the national level to file a class action suit last August on the grounds that the implementation of the local systems had deviated and were deviating from the constitutional mandate. The suit was admitted, and we are awaiting the court's resolution for the moment. But there are other sort of less evident but equally important problems in the design of the system itself. Jacqueline Pechard, the outgoing president of the coordinating committee, referred to one of them in her last public address to this body. And she asked, how can six different agencies pertaining to the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of power as well as an autonomous body, coordinate their efforts smoothly if they differ so much in their regulations, agendas, and priorities. This is a very serious obstacle and will become even more serious if it is not dealt with soon enough. And added to this is the glaring omission of three key pieces of the coordinating committee whose appointments are still missing. These are the newly created Special Prosecutor for Anti-Corruption, Fiscalia Anticorrupción, the 18 magistrates that I referred to, and the Auditor Superior de la Federación, the Superior Audit Office of the Federation, whose term expired at the end of 2017. And without these essential actors, needless to say, the system is crippled, and it, carry, it cannot carry out one of its basic mandates. Uh, which is the effective investigation and punishment of acts of corruption. 
Well, as we all know, Mexico is entering a very difficult municipal, uh, sorry, difficult electoral year. More than 3,000 positions are up for election at the federal, state, and municipal level. Uh, this is a result of the political reform enacted under the Pacto por México. And the competition promises to be fierce, even vicious, and polarization has already set in. So this makes agreeing on nominations a virtually impossible task. The political consensus of the first years of the Peña Nieto administration has been broken. Um, so, um, and all of these scandals um, have created a, a situation where dealing with such inflammable and potentially dangerous issues as the proven existence of corruption networks that interfere in electoral processes, the embezzlement and misuse of public funds, and the penetration of state institutions by organized crime, among others, make it very difficult to reach a consensus. Uh, but however, the appointment of the new head of the Superior Audit Office is of the utmost importance, and that responsibility is in the Chamber of Deputies. Um, and it, so far, none of, none of the candidates um, have proven to be wholly suitable, and this is a situation with potentially serious consequences for the system. On the other hand, um, the appointment of the special prosecutor, Fiscal Anticorrupción, the other missing piece of the system, is embroiled in a larger and more defining dilemma, which is the creation of a truly independent, autonomous, and professional general prosecutor. Fiscalia General in Mexico. And until this is resolved, any attempt to fight corruption effectively will be hampered by political pressures and complicities of all sorts. And the recent, just the recent evaluation of the measures undertaken by Mexico against money laundering and financing of terrorism by the Financial Action Task Force is just a very eloquent example of the poor performance of government agencies, especially the PGR, in this highly sensitive manner. So, matter. So, if we do not refashion the Procuraduría General de la República and replace that institution, which is an institution dating from the authoritarian um, past of Mexico, which is not going away quickly, but anyway. <laughs> but it has to be replaced by an independent general prosecutor. Um, and there was a reform in 214 uh, that mandated this, but it was an incomplete and nominal reform, and it left the body of the Procuraduría virtually intact. Um, so its institutional design as it stands today is being very seriously challenged. Um, I won't go into the details, but there was even a clause, a transitory clause, that allowed for its incumbent, appointed directly by the president with senatorial ratification, to continue in the position. And this prompted the same civil society coalition that promoted the creation of the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción, which is a very interesting uh, event, to join forces with human rights and victims organizations, as well as organized business, in a coalition under the names of Vamos por una Fiscalía que Sirva and Aquí y Ahora. And this coalition has been successful in overturning the automatic transfer of the incumbent to the new arrangement and is now demanding a complete constitutional reform with a total makeover of the Fiscalía General in order to produce a modern, professional, independent, and autonomous body. This means deferring the appointment of a special prosecutor for anti-corruption, who in any case, even if that special prosecutor were appointed today, would only have a few months to work. Um, but of course, the possibility of this constitutional reform in an electoral year, such as the one we're facing, does not look too promising but it is certainly desirable. Um, so as we all know, the latest results of the World um, Justice Project's Rule of Law Index for 2017 gave Mexico a very low ranking, 0.45, 
where one represents a greater adherence to the rule of law. The score is lower than those of Sri Lanka, Lebanon, and the Philippines, lower than the score of El Salvador, and actually close to the bottom of the Latin American region. And as we know, the score covers indicators on constraints on governmental powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, and civil and, cr and administrative, civil and criminal justice. So Mexico scored of all these indicators, it scored lowest in the criminal justice one and on the one on absence of corruption, particularly regarding the effectiveness of the correctional system and the absence of corruption in the legislature. So all of this is very discouraging <laughs> for the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción. <laughs> the results of the project point to the evident truth that corruption cannot be tackled effectively in an environment where the rule of law is so weak. And controlling corruption, as we have learned, and as the system is, is made to, requires a holistic approach. Uh, and without a fully independent and professional Fiscalia General, any attempt to do so is an illusion. So thus, the next step that the Comité de Participación Ciudadana needs to take, and this is my personal position, is to support the efforts of the Aquí y Ahora Coalition. An independent and professional Fiscalía General is the key to any serious attempt to fight corruption and establish the rule of law. And without that, it will be virtually impossible to do so. And I would like to make three concluding points. First, the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción is an urgently needed and long-term project that implies a transformation of state and society. The failure of the anti-corruption program indeed would imply conditions threatening my nation's security. Its complex design reflects the ambitiousness of confronting a systemic and endemic phenomenon. And I may add, it has not <laughs> failed yet despite some early reports of demise by some opinion makers, including the New York Times. Second, the fact that the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción has succeeded in integrating civil society into its structure and provided it with a leadership role is its unique and redeeming feature. The Comité de Participación Ciudadana needs to take advantage of this position to the utmost. It must increase and broaden its citizen base and its relationship with all sectors of civil society. It has to branch out and reach out to the human rights of uh, civil society organizations, to victims organizations, to environmentalists. It has to break away from the very, um, I would say, professional and knowledgeable civil society organizations that work wholly on governance issues and reach out uh, and broaden its citizen space in order to build the rule of law that the country so badly needs. And third, in this particular moment, heading toward the crucial elections in July of this year, the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción is at once empowered by the embrace of anti-corruption rhetoric by all political parties, because all political parties have begun now to espouse their positions on anti-corruption. And of course, but of course, we must be extra vigilant to avoid partisan politicization. But we only have to listen. I mean, I think one of the things that we need to understand very clearly is that we work on principles. Uh, we don't take stand with political parties. And in fact, we only have to listen to the underlying cry of protest from the citizenry of Mexico. So thank you very much. I hope that this Kind of a little disheartening, Muddy Claire, but you did save it there at the end with a few <laughs> uh, positives, things that could come from this experience. We have just a very few minutes here. If there are a couple of questions from the audience, Maureen Meyer has a question. Anyone on this back right-hand side I missed last time? All right, Maureen, go ahead, and I'll take one other one if it's quick. All right, thanks, Eric. Thank you, um, Marie Claire Maureen Meyer from WOLA. I had a question on um, will versus capacity. 
issue. And as an organization, we certainly are putting a lot of effort into the Fiscalia General and what that means for, for Mexico. But in the event that there was more political will to go after corruption cases, my question is more, do you think there's enough capacity within the judicial system to really go you know, investigate the way they should? Looking at Duarte or case in, in Veracruz right now where some things are falling apart, it looks like because the PGR prosecutors didn't do their work the right way. Just wondering if there's, what would be the balance there between there's really no will to go after versus they, even if there was the will, would there be the, the skill set there? That's a tough question. <laughs> Is there one other question here? Um, uh, David Chirk, okay. Y you mentioned at the very end uh, not being partisan um, in responses to uh, problems of corruption. I'm, I'm curious, um, we're about to see an election in which there are, pretty much everybody's an independent candidate. Uh, in, in other words, their their party affiliation is is questionable at best. Okay. Uh, okay. In the United States, fighting corruption uh, took place uh, very much so in the early 20s uh, and was driven by largely independent progressive movements. I'm wondering if that's what it takes, uh, a shift away from partisanship towards uh, good governance candidates, and, and how we're likely to see that in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Good. Mark, Claire, you have a, a couple of minutes here to sure. respond. Okay. Um, Maureen, you asked a very difficult question. I cannot answer, uh, I cannot give you a general answer for that, but I would say, for instance, in Chihuahua, uh, there has been a, I would say a remarkable performance of the judicial system. Um, and, but it's not only of the judicial system. I mean, what worked in Chihuahua, I think, was a very close cooperation. And they don't have a sistema local anticorrupción yet, but they did work very closely, all the different government agencies. Um, and obviously, their justice system is, I think, it was one of the first that actually reformed the criminal justice system reformed about 15 years ago, and, and, uh, and now I think it's beginning to perform much better than others in other states. So I think it's going to depend very much on the locality and very much on, again, who is governing and the citizen support that it has been able to achieve. The investigations of this corruption network in Chihuahua were met by I mean, the, the President Peña Nieto dismissed them as electoral. Um, and a couple of days later, 420 businessmen had signed a pledge supporting in Chihuahua, supporting the governor. So, I mean, I think it's going to depend very, very much on local circumstances. Um, and just to give you um, another answer to this, um, just last week we issued a press statement because the... Um, one of these phantom enterprises, Empresas Fantasma, which are used for, for deviating public money, um, filed a, an amparo, uh, in, and it was in the Supreme Court. Um, and the amparo is against one of the regulations of the Treasury designed specifically to be able to, to, to investigate these Empresas Fantasma and stop them. And so, we don't know what's going to happen in the Supreme Court, but it looked like, I mean, that's why we issued our press statement, because it looked like it was probably going to be given to them. So, I mean, this gives you an indication of <laughs> where we stand regarding the judiciary. Um, so, and the other question was, um, well, hopefully uh, one of the candidates will come up with a good governance platform. Um, I don't know. I mean, so far they have all the three, well, I mean, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, I would leave him aside. He's been uh, talking about good governance uh, for decades. Uh, good governance seems to depend on his particular will, so I don't really know how, you know, <laughs> how much that will play out. Uh, but with the other two pre-candidates, pre-candidatos, um, well, they have a lot of baggage. Um, and they haven't quite made convincing um, 
este, arguments yet, but we'll see, we'll see, because it certainly is right there. I mean, it is, it is a, I think it's going to be the most important um, subject in the, in the campaign. So we'll see what happens, and, um, and yes, I'm, I mean, I just want to end by saying yeah, this is a very dismal, it is, um, situation. But I don't think that we have any other alternative but to just keep pushing and, and try to make that Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción work. But it can't work in a vacuum. It has to go hand in hand with other fundamental reforms. We have about three minutes left, and I know this is probably an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> if you take off your, your, your gorra, your hat, <laughs> as the Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción, what in, in your terrific and uh, lifelong experience have you seen as effective ways of combating corruption? I mean, what has worked from the perspective of Mexico? There has to have been some positive experiences or elements. Well, I think, I mean, I am, uh, and, and I am going to be accused of being partisan, but I think that the Corral experience has been pretty amazing. I mean, um, uh, he Say a little a, bit more about that. Yeah, he held a meeting um, about two weeks ago with uh, the Red de Rendición de Cuentas, and he brought his uh, team with him, you know, his prosecutor and his um, auditor, and, and, uh, and, and they just, you know, we sat there for three hours and just listened to how they went about investigating this corruption network that was run by the previous governor and, you know, who were the key people involved in this. And, um, and it was just very interesting to learn from that experience. Um, and I think the, the key factor there was that they actually were able to undertake or to implement a very holistic approach with a lot of technical expertise. He really stressed that they had a group of analistas financieros working there because to follow the money right. trail is very difficult. Um, so I think uh, that you need a combination of that, of technical expertise, the right kind of officials and, and political support or popular support too. So independent ability to investigate, yes. technical capacity, and the role of civil society in some ways. And key. courage. And courage. <laughs> Easy enough. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I apologize, we've run over a little bit, uh, but we do, we will continue to discuss these topics uh, when we launch our book, The Missing Reform, Strengthening the Rule of Law in Mexico. I know many of the panelists have profound ideas about these issues. So if you would break just for five minutes, grab a coffee, stretch your legs, and come back, we can keep this on track. Thank you very much.